Hi guys, it's Ange. Who is James McKenney? A lot of you won't know who James McKenney is at all. And some of you have typed his name into Google and happened upon this by chance. James McKinney was born on February 16, 1843. He died on February 15, 1916. He was the son of Daniel Newton McKinney and J Judah Judith McKinney. Judah was the daughter of Peter Carey. Peter Carey is another interesting character, and we will get into him later. So, why in the world do I want to talk about James McKinney? Why would I want to talk about a person that most people have never heard of? Well, so here's the thing. As time is going on, I have done research. I have spoken to museums. I've done as much digging as I possibly can to understand what happened on Malacca Island in 1912. It's important to my family. And the reason I'm talking about him publicly is because since recent events have occurred, this story is being told much more. It's starting to be brought out into the open. And I'm actually seeing people writing articles, making songs, talking about them online. And most people only know the stories they've heard in passing. And I do think it's interesting. However, people who are pushing this narrative through negativity is very upsetting. You see, my great-grandfather was born on Malaga Island, and I was speaking to my father last night, and the effects that this story has on him still hurts him to this day. It's very upsetting to him. Mostly because when this happened in 1912, it happened over a hundred years ago, their voices weren't heard. And actually living or being related to this island where my father lived was a secret. No one was supposed to know. They didn't they wanted to assimilate as best as they could to, to quote-unquote, normal, upright society. And they tried to hide their past as much as they could. And the problem is that the people knew who they were. And they made their lives very, very difficult. So, as I said before, they tried to hide it as much as they could. Where they came from. And so, they decided when they would leave the island, that they would bury this experience and put it into the past, and they would never speak of what happened on Malaga Island again, ever, to anyone. And the catch is, and like all things in history, this story would be told again. For the older people who remember what happened during this time, I think that they're fearful 
Their voices were not heard. The only voices who were heard were the governor, the newspapers, and a family of missionaries who came to their, to their island to help them and unintentionally destroyed their lives. This family of missionaries were kind souls and they believed what they were doing was for the greater good and that their services were, were not just helping the people, but they were helping God do good work. And no matter what they did, no matter how hard they tried to fix the situation, it just got worse and worse and worse. It was inevitable. It was in a time where we have a mixed race community living with living in a time of eugenics and eugenics play, plays a huge part in this story i want to be very clear this story isn't just about a bunch of racist people it's in my estimate estimation for me i believe that it's eugenics. It's eugenics that played the biggest role in this. And we'll get into that in a little while. So, who was James McKinney? Well, James McKinney was a well to do Scottish man who didn't really like living the stuffy life of the Victorians. He was an extremely talented violinist and the newspapers when they talk about James McKinney and tomorrow we are going to read the most famous in my opinion newspaper article which says it all about eugenics and how it played a role in this story, but here is my introduction on James. So as I was saying, he's a talented violin violinist, and although the newspapers called him a fiddle player, I believe they did that to downplay his talent, in my estimate, in my, that's my best guesstimate. And I don't want to do that. I want to show you all who James is through my eyes. So as James is playing the violin or fiddle, he is getting more and more, more talented and he's starting to make a name for himself. He's starting to be requested to play at town events um, weddings, in local gatherings, more and more often. And as he's starting to make this name for himself, he's starting to feel a little closed in. And we don't know exactly why he did this, but seemingly one day he just decides he's had enough and he drops out of society and he moves to Malaga Island again we don't know why he picked Malaga we don't we, we just don't know maybe someday one day we might find a journal a letter something but for right now we, we, we don't know So he moves to Malaga Island to live a quiet fishing life and play his music as he wanted. And he did still play music in the town occasionally when requested. He married a young woman named Salome Griffin. She is the granddaughter of Fatima Griffin, and if you remember, 
we talked about in our in the last who was Ben Darling we learned that Ben Darling's granddaughters moved to Malaga Island and Fatima is one of Ben Darling's grandchildren and the grandmother of Salome who is James McKinney's wife so there's the connection to Ben Darling that I spoke of earlier. Now James is interesting because he wasn't just a talented artist, although he was very talented. Um, he was very charismatic and for some reason when the newspapers would come to interview people on the island, they always chose him to interview. And we don't exactly know why it was him. We have our thoughts and ideas, and I really don't want to share those. But he was very charismatic, but he was very guarded. He was always very guarded, and it was sort of like a yes or no answer, but again, they would always want to talk to him, so he gets this, this leadership role, if you will, in the community because, he, you know, this is who they want to speak to. Over time, there's, I mean, hundreds of newspaper articles. They always point him in such a great light, but yet, their newspaper is trying to shock people. You remember we talked about yellow journalism the other day, and in that time period, that was what people wanted. They wanted to hear something shocking and um, manipulate people's emotions and get readers to read like they did with the Lizzie Borden case. It was every day they would talk to people in the town and they would tell a crazy story and the crazier the stories were, the more they were listed in these newspapers. And, and so this is kind, sort of similar. But like I said, eugenics plays a big part. What happens is this governor placed it wants to make this island in Maine. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So it's very, very close to shore to the mainland. Like, if you, as my father said last night, if you took a, a, a football in one hand and you have a really strong arm, you would hit it from the mainland to that island. Like, it, it, it's really close. They, the governor, during this time period, cars were just created, um, were, were starting to get popular, and now people were starting to learn that they could travel across the country, and they didn't have to take a train. They could do this in their Ford, and people would write stories about their, their traveling to this place and that, and this island being so close to shore, what a great tourist attraction this would be, and it would help this, the town of Phippsburg so much to get more tourism. And the, the one thing that they had in their way was this mixed race community living on Malaga Island. Eugenics was playing such a big role that Having a mixed race community was not seen as, as anything good. So he wants this to become a tourist area and he needs to get these people to go. But there's a problem. And the problem is these people have lived here for seven decades. So what do they do? They do what they did, and they put on a really good smear campaign. They perpetuated it, and this smear campaign went on 
for not, you know, a month or two, like years. Like, I think I saw a newspaper article from like Wisconsin or something from the 1870s. So this smear campaign about this island went on for decades. But then when this governor comes in, he really, really, really pushes hard to get them to, to leave. During this time, it happens that this missionary and his wife, George and Lucy Lane, moved to, I believe, Horse Island. They live on, it's about a half a mile away, I believe. They decide that during their days out, when they're just traveling around the islands, they find Malaga. They find children. They're very religious. They see these, these children who want to learn. And they decide that they want to build a schoolhouse. So they go home and they write letters to their church in in Massachusetts. Start talking about this this mixed race community on Malaga, how they want to help them and they want to build a schoolhouse on this island for the children and do good works. Now, I want to be very clear here, and I want you to understand this. These people were kind. These people thought what they were doing was good. They did not have a mean bone in their body. Everything they did was for the good of this community. The people in this community have only said good things about these people, and the, and the people George and Lucy Lane have only ever talked about the families and the children in this community in, high, in the highest, kindest regards. So please understand when I tell you what they did was truly out of the kindness of their hearts. So they get a hold of a deacon. I believe his name is, we are going to read the journals and letters of Lucy Lane on another day. But he, I believe his name is G.F. Woolley, and G.F. Woolley, amazingly, kept all the letters from the Lanes doing this um, charitable cause for Malaga Island. And so Lucy and George get a hold of their deacon at their church in, where they live in Massachusetts, and they start a campaign to charity and fundraise. And part of that was putting things in the newspaper. They wanted to get as much money as they could to build this schoolhouse. The first thing that they needed, though, was a boat. Because George, even though he was a captain, he's older now, and he's a little arthritic. So it's, it's about the time period where motorboats are becoming more popular. And they're thinking it would be much easier for them to get to Malaga Island to do their good works if they have a motorboat. So this all starts off with George's need for, I think it's like $50 for a motor for his boat. So they go on to do all this campaigning in newspapers to do their good works to, to, to get this schoolhouse built on Malaga Island. As they're doing their newspaper articles and their letters to their church to do these good works on Malaga Island, Governor Plaisted, he's incensed because he wants these people to go. How, how are they going to get people to go? Like when George and Lucy Lane are painting these people in such a kind light, how is he going to get these people out of here? So Placed doubles down, and he starts sending literal scientists, eugenic scientists, to question these children. These children, who some of them have never gone to school a day in their lives, part 
I believe one of the questions that's asked to them is, like, who is president or something. And now for a six-year-old child who's never went to a public school as we see them today, how would they know who's who's never been educated? How would they know who, president, who the president is? And so if they failed one of these tests, they would be sent to this school, and it was called the School for the Feeble-Minded at Pineland. One woman who was sent to Pineland, I believe was Salome's half-sister. She is sent to Pineland for one of these ridiculous questions that she probably didn't know the answer to. She lives there until, I believe, 1985. Or no, 19... Yeah, 1985 or 86. When she gets out, she is almost a hundred years old. Think about that. Living somewhere from 1912 to 1985, being in prison because you don't know who the president is. For almost a hundred years. And she gets out and she passes away at the age of 103. So she's just one of the many casualties of Malaga Island. And there's many, many more. But as I say, so as we start talking about Malaga Island, there's so many pieces to the puzzle. There's so many parts. That I think is why people are talking about it more and more and more. It's like, if I wanted to talk to you about eugenics, I could talk to you all day about Malika. If I wanted to talk to you about racism, I could talk to you about Malika. If I wanted to talk to you about charity, I could talk to you about Malika. If I could talk, if I wanted to talk about mixed race communities, I could talk to you about Malika. There's so many stories that can be told from this one story. That's why it's, it's, hard for me to tell all of James in just one 30 minute podcast. James' story takes a long time to tell because there is a lot of cogs in this wheel. And as we go, we'll learn more and more. And I want you guys to make your own I want you to use your own opinion. I want you to use, to do your own research. I want you to do all of that yourself. And I want you to come to your own opinion on your own. I have my opinions and, and you'll have yours. So, James McKenney, and tomorrow we will read the newspaper, the famous yellow, yellow journalism newspaper of, of James McKenney the king of Malaga Island. Alright guys, I'll see you again soon.